<laughs> okay, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. This is the February 18th meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Let's go with uh, roll call item number two. Mike Renault's here. James Pysior. Here. Kevin Browning. Here. Bob DeMitt. Here. Carrie Boardman. Here. Debbie Saffel. Here. Hayden Ambrose. Here. And Scott Schaefer. Here. All right. The quorum present. Next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from the January 14, 2015 meeting. Do we have a motion to approve? A motion. Second. And a motion and second. Any discussion? No discussion. Let's have a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Okay, so we have uh, items four and five. We're going to switch up a little bit tonight. Uh, the main uh, item on the agenda is a, an action item precluded by public hearing. Uh, I want to talk about citizen participation for a little bit. I've got a sign up sheet in the back. If you want to participate in citizen participation, make sure you sign up on there. We're going to limit comments just because of the amount of people here to two minutes per person. That is your own time that can't be designated to somebody else, so make sure you're concise. Let us know what's on your mind about the issues at hand, okay? Um, let's go ahead and move into the public hearing portion, and we're talking about tonight a conditional use permit that's been applied for racetrack facility at 348 East Old US 40 Highway, and this application should be considered by the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, for recommendation to the Board of Aldermen, which would then make it an ordinance. So anything we do tonight is a recommendation. This doesn't lock anything down, um, but we will be making a recommendation to the Board one way or another. So um, let's get into the public hearing portion. How we're going to do this tonight, because there are so many people, we're going to give the city a chance to um, describe some of the history, things going on, um, how this kind of came about, and some of their ideas and thoughts on the topic. Then we'd like to open it up to the public generally. Uh, so that would be the time if you could make an orderly line at that point or just come up when the next person's finished. We'll be keeping track of the two minutes up here. And then after that, the applicant, Mr. Shrout, can come forward and kind of wrap us up before uh, we close the public hearing out and it moves over to the board at that point, the Planning and Zoning Board, um, for either a motion or no motion, uh, but most likely some discussion one way or another. So any questions on that? Okay, so let's go ahead and start the public hearing portion. I'm going to turn it over to the city. Uh, Mr. Renault said, uh, tonight we're here to consider a request for a conditional use permit from Dennis Shrout to operate a racetrack facility. Uh, by code in the city of Grain Valley, the only way to operate a racetrack is through a conditional use permit. And kind of touching on uh, what he said earlier, the process for that, um, once we get the application, is a public hearing at the Planning and Zoning Commission, and then follow that up with a public hearing at the Board of Aldermen level, um, where there'll be two reads to approve that. Um, I kind of thought you'd give just a brief history of where we've been with the racetrack and uh, kind of how we got here. Uh, December of 2003, Valley Speedway was issued a conditional use permit to operate. That was not Mr. Shroud at that time. He purchased the track later, um, but that kind of started uh, Valley Speedway in Grain Valley. Since 2003, um, the racetrack has been a topic of conversation at numerous planning and zoning meetings, Board of Aldermen meetings, um, and just um, community development committee meetings, and pretty much any kind of meeting you could think of. Um, and it's been split. There's been comments for and against, um, you know, so support and a little opposition. Um, and what we did was put a summary of those minutes together for anything, any time it was mentioned at the planning and zoning commission level or the Board of Aldermen, and that was included in the uh, Planning Commission's packet, just kind of to give you an idea of the types of conversations that have taken place over the years. Um, I would say the majority of the complaints over that time have been focused on sound level, races going late, and weeknight races. Those probably are the three things that have come up the most. Um, multiple sound studies have been conducted by both the city and uh, Mr. Shrout. Uh, la last sound study actually was commissioned by Mr. Shrout. Uh, the sound study results and the other conditions, uh, the Board of Aldermen voted in July of 2014 to revoke the conditional use permit that had been in place since 2003. Um, they made that decision effective October 1st, and, and in essence, he was able to finish out the year. At the same time, the Board also told staff, or directed staff, 
to work with Mr. Shroud on a new conditional use permit. So we're here today. This is that first step is having the public hearing in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Now with the permit itself um, throughout this time, one thing that has become apparent is that obviously racetrack emits a sound that's not something that you hear every day. And with that, when you hear it, it kind of can catch people off guard because it's something different. It's not the car you kind of get used to going up and down the street. So in some ways, it kind of, you know, the racetrack is what it is. It's always going to be a different noise that people are going to think is maybe louder than what it really is. But when determining what conditions need to be tied to this permit, uh, the important thing that needs to be thought about is what conditions most fairly allow the racetrack to operate, but also uh, protect the other you know, business and property owners in the city so they're not negatively affected. So it's kind of finding that balance is the whole goal. Um, included in the packet was kind of an outline of Mr. Shrout's request as far as what he would like to see included in the permit. I've kind of gone through these and I'm, I'll read them off and then kind of give you our thoughts on those. Uh, 45 race car events per year. And this is not to include the March test and tunes. On a yearly base, basis, Mr. Shrout generally in March has some basically practice type sessions. Uh, so it's not a formal race. Um, so you'd be looking at April to October or seven months. Um, and with that, it'd be what we'd look at is, or what he's proposing is to have two weeknights, like a Friday and Saturday this week, and then the next week would just be one night, like just Saturday. Um, it can kind of get a little confusing, so we put a little exhibit together that just shows the, what that would look like from April to October if they did that, that switch off. And I'll touch on it in a minute, but it also shows uh, the possibility of weeknight races. Um, but with that, kind of right now, what Mr. Shroud has on his website is a tentative 2015 schedule. I believe shows 38 events. Um, so just kind of give you an idea of what they're, they're going for there. Uh, 11 o'clock p.m. curfew. Um, the curfew is something that there's been comment going back and forth on. Um, I think generally in the past he's tried to be done by 10. Um, I don't know that that's happened every time, but I think that was kind of the general rule was being done by 10. Um, and kind of going into that, he's also asked for 90 decibels until 10 o'clock and 80 decibels from 10 to 11. One of the things that's kind of come out in some of these meetings is that 10 o'clock is kind of used as a break-off point to where you might have a certain decibel reading that's allowed, and then after 10 it goes down. It's just later at night. Um, it also asked that we measured 1,200 feet from the center of the tra track with a one-hour weighted average. Uh, with that, Staffordley is probably measuring at the property line uh, as a little bit more accurate way to go for a few reasons. One of the biggest things, neither side has any control, you know, the city or Mr. Shrout with everything that's within that, would be within that 1,200-foot radius. So to know what's going to happen there in the future, that's, okay, you have to make a big assumption with that. You'd also have to make an assumption as to what that number would need to be. Just because all of our tests have been done at the property line, to go and now move it back to 1,200 feet uh, from the center of the racetrack, that's kind of going in again and having to make assumptions and may or may not be right. And the question would be whether we can come up with that, that number that's correct. Um, I think there's a good amount of data that's been collected over the years. And with this last study that Mr. Shrout um, did, we kind of, we asked them to get a little bit deeper into it because one of the, the items has been, what are we looking at with sound? Are you talking about the entire time the track is open or are you talking about just the racing? And what we've been going at is just when the cars are on the track, what is the actual sound volume or sound level? And so we had Mr. Shrout's consultant um, go down and break out the feature events for the different classes. So just the time that the features were on the racetrack, and that's what's included in your packet. Um, it's shown as the excluded time. Um, and the number you want to pay attention to is where it says LEQ. That's a weighted equivalent average. That's something that we've kind of, you know, both sides have agreed is the, you know, the proper way to measure sound. So it kind of takes out those peaks and valleys and kind of gives you that average number. Um, with that, uh, he'd ask for the, to look at a one hour weighted average. Kind of what we had talked about in the past was going to a three minute. Um, but, but with that, what they submitted there, those particular tests, the loudest actual LEQ was 75 and a half. And I believe that was for the A mods uh, that night, which typically would be the, the loudest class. 
And I think it also has the number of cars that are on the, the class that are on that, that sheet. That was using the three minute or the one hour? I believe on that one he went back to the three minute. Um, the one minute. So even shorter. And with that, it was still at 75 and a half. Um, you know, one of the things that's come out you know, time and time again from Mr. Shroud is that he doesn't want the track to be any louder than what it is, but he wants to be able to operate as it is. So that's something to keep in mind. We have those charts there. That's something to kind of go off of as far as a number. Um, the next thing that had been brought up was all cars must meet the 100 decibel limit measured at 100 feet. It's something that we had talked about in the past. I don't know that that's necessarily a needed measure if we come to a reasonable agreement on a, a level at the property line. That just seems like another thing on top that may not may or may not coincide with that number. So if we can come to an agreement at the property line, that seems that's something that's not going to change. The property line is going to be the property line. But that might be a better way to go about it. Um, next was a seven weeknight events per year. When we say weeknight, we'd be looking at Monday through Thursday and consider Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the, the weekend. Kind of an example for that would have been one weekend or one weeknight race per month um, with the possibility, uh, what Mr. Shrout's kind of told staff and the board in the past is that most of the weeknight races are going to be a, you know, a traveling series or something to that effect where there's not as much control as far as scheduling. And with that, there could be two nights that are tied, two, three nights that could be tied there. So however that combination happens, that that would all count towards that seven week nights that would be uh, that would be allowed in this scenario. Um, historically, week week nights have you know drawn more complaints than the weekends. Um, one of the things that we have heard uh, quite a few times is that if we're going to have the week night races, it just needs to be when school is not in session because that's been the biggest complaint is kids going to school for um, you know, try, or trying to go to bed to get ready for school and not being able to sleep. So that might be something to keep in mind with that. Um, all, cars, our, all car classes must run a functional race uh, muffler. Couldn't agree with that more. That's something that I'm sure everybody's heard multiple times is what mufflers on the cars and it kind of seems to be changing all the time. Uh, one of the things we would say is, you know, on both sides with the city and Mr. Shrout that we'd hope we'd be looking at all the different manufacturers to see if there is something new out there in the future. Uh, but the idea being, obviously, that it's not going to be any louder than it is now. Um, the next thing was the city will not limit quieter events. And by quieter events, you have thrown out motorcycle events, demo derby, truck and tractor pulls, go-kart events, all non-motorized events, and any event with less than 10 cars on the track at a time. It's kind of a tough condition to think about. Now, obviously, the non-motorized events, there's no limit on that. That doesn't fall into the to the, uh, the racetrack, the permit part of it. So whether it's a Tough mutter thing or um, any, anything like that, that wouldn't count. When you start looking at these other things, it's kind of hard to say because I don't think any of us really know what that level would be for those events. I don't know that we've tested any of the, um, you know, the truck and tractor pulls a lot of times tend to be pretty loud, but I couldn't tell you exactly what that would be. So that's kind of a that's one that you're going to have to think about there. That's kind of a tough, uh, tough one on that because it's kind of hard to blanket all of those things together and just say yes or no. So maybe Mr. Shroud can shed some more light on that a little bit later here. Um, the last thing I have is the length of the permit. By code in the conditional use section, you are allowed to establish a length of time for a permit. Um, I've kind of been advised that maybe three years would be something that would be reasonable thought behind that being a lot can happen in three years as far as whether it's different technology or any number of things that could happen. So at the end of that three-year period, making sure that we're, everything's still reasonable and it still works, um, but it is enough time to be able to plan forward. It's not on a year-by-year know, -year basis that way. Um, that's kind of the uh, quick and dirty, I guess, on what we're looking at here with the, the permit. And that's kind of taken into consideration what Mr. Shrout has given us um, that he would like to see included. Um, and after hearing uh, comments from the public tonight and Mr. Shrout, that's going to be your job to um, decide if those conditions or other conditions are appropriate and moving forward with it. Any other comment from the city? 
Okay. Any need for clarification from Z? Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to uh, the public portion of the public hearing. Does anyone have any comments they would like to make? If you do so, uh, please step forward. Yes. My name is Lance Herman. I would uh, state your name just Andrew, like that. Andrew Herman. And then your address, too. 901 Northwest Poplar Court. It's out in Rosewood Hills. I am a lifelong resident of this area, though, and my family has been. Motorsports is on the master plan, has always been on the master plan when push for improvement was started in this area back in the old, old regime of the city of Grain Valley. Uh, I am for the development of Grain Valley. I'm also a commercial real estate broker and developer. I've worked on some other sites. What you have here is a destination for people to come. And with calculations, I've done this roughly off motel rooms that can be rented and money that's spent at Casey's and our food places like Sonic McDonald's. It's about $153,000 about every other month in revenue. That's just a low ball number. That's about every seven races is what we're going off. But that does not count fuel that's bought at Casey's. This is just people going in and purchasing things. A question, and this won't go into your time, but um, those numbers, you're attributing that directly to the races? To the races only, yes. Okay. How do you get that? How do by, you get by rough estimates of how many people come to the races. How many, you're run, running about 500 people through the races, besides citizens and spectators and also... Uh, drivers per month per I say about every race has about three to five hundred people okay at it okay and then you're going to give, give your numbers on how much they spend and that varies due to fuel prices and that varies due to what they eat also and coming from the commercial development side you have what they call destination places Bass Pro is one of the sites I've helped on in Independence and and the event center some of the things you see when somebody comes to your area to look, like McDonald's. They do three to five years worth of re research at the median household income in the area. What draws people to the town? Grain Valley is just on I-70. We are, they can go to Oak Grove because they have a Walmart. That's a destination for people. We have something here. If we work it right, we actually can produce a nice town with more development, more tax revenue coming in from business instead of citizens, which help pay for the schooling schools, roads, and such like that. So I am for the racetrack staying. I know there is a noise ordinance, but I live out at 901 Northwest Poplar. I grew up at Pink Hill and Buckner Tarsley out, out north here, and they sound like bees. And I, I know there's a difference, that, but you also have an opportunity, along with the noise levels, I can hear whiskey tangos at that location, at my house at 901 Northwest Poplar. So we're, we're sitting here trying to close somebody down or suspend somebody's business that can generate revenue like Whiskey Tango's does. And Whiskey Tango's is also a younger person's a destination spot, where this is bringing from 17 different states. We're having racers come from Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, uh, Arkansas. I, I can't remember what other states, but I think Oklahoma runs a lot of them. And they might not be here all the time. That's what those seven races he's talking about during the weeknights. Those people will take lodging, they'll take more fuel, and more, more beverage for themselves. That's all I have to say about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Question for you, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, my question is for the city based on something that you said. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, is there any way to measure, uh, do we see an increase in sales tax versus race months where, where we have a, a track racing versus those months where we don't? I mean, do we see those numbers at all? Do you have any way to check into that? Yeah. Steal his mic here. So um, we don't have access to individual business sales tax records. Uh, we can tell month to month uh, sales tax incomes. And uh, typically, it's more of an economic driver, but the fall time is usually uh, when we have the most sales tax come into the city. Um, I would say it's pretty flat uh, throughout the summer. There's not really any any high peaks or not. Um, and just one further point of clarification, um, I think what he was referring to is, is revenue is probably gross revenue coming into the city as far as 
uh, somebody pays 20 bucks for a dinner, that's you know $20 towards that $157,000. I do know that um, in order to generate that much sales tax, it'd be six million dollars a month. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty level throughout the year, Mr. Pricer. Understood. I just wanted to, to clarify because with with sales tax, you at least see if there's going to be an increase or decrease during those time frames on the amount of revenue coming in. Yeah, and one of those things, you know. Race fans have always, you know, been good about when they come to town, uh, they fuel up, they stop at Casey's, that sort of thing. We're not going to see an increase from the fuel. Uh, that's that's not a positive or a negative statement, but we're not going to see those numbers reflected just because all that money goes to the state and then it's dispersed to us based off of our population. So it's really hard for us to use that indicator as, as far as how much business is coming. But I know any night that we have a race down there, Casey's is packed. They they love it. So. All right. Thank you, Council. Uh, any other comment? <coughs> I wrote it down. Uh, Hello, my name is Larry Waters. Uh, I live in Kansas City, Kansas, 2401 North 77th Street. I'm not a speaker and probably not saying this proper format, but I'd like to say something. I am interested in to see what your plans are for your town, Valley Speedway. This is a family affair giving back to the town of Valley. Uh, he's not a rich man. What do you people plan to do? Yes, times are changing. Why not be family oriented? He's out there, out of the track by t at least 10 p.m. on a Friday and Saturday night. Why not make a change and keep out of towners and business owners coming through your town? Maybe business would stay open longer. Thank you. Like I say, I'm I uh, live in Kansas City, Kansas, and and when we come up here, we bring two or three people. We stop, we eat on the way home, we buy gas. Not all the time in Valley, Blue Springs, but a lot of the trouble you have is a lot of businesses aren't open past nine o'clock. I mean, you got your fast food restaurants, you know, McDonald's, Subway, but Zarda's closed. A lot of the other ones close. Uh, Taco Bueno, they all close early, so. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Um, you live in Kansas City, Kansas. Is Lakeside Speedway still open out there by the... Mm -hmm. why, why do you come out here instead of going to Lakeside? I raced there on Friday night. Okay. Uh, finished sixth in the points, and I've won the championship in Valley this year. So, uh, but uh, I like it. It's a different track. Um, it's, I've been racing Lakeside since 94. And Lakeside's always had its problems. I don't know if you've heard about them, but it's, al it's always had their problems. It seems like when I go other places, I got wins at Heartland, you know, I-35, uh, I-70, Valley. Uh, these smaller tracks are just more home body people. You know, I, I, I like going into town. I mean, it's just a fun place to go. Lakeside, it's out there nowhere. I live nine miles from Lakeside. So like I said, I've been going out there for 20 years. But it's more of a big corporate deal, Lakeside is. Uh, Valley is, you know, family-oriented. The kids are involved in it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things going on. It's not, it's not all, I don't know what you'd say, corporate or, you know, it's, it's fun. That's one of the reasons why I did so good is because I'm hard-strung for Lakeside. And when I came over here, that's the honest truth, that I was diligent in all, everything I'd done. That's why I was... I attribute it to that, why I did so good this year. So. Questions? All right, thanks, Thank sir. Step right up. Evening. My name's Alan Hannaway, 408 Main Street. I've lived in Grain Valley a little bit over 30 years. I've seen a lot of changes. Seems like after four or five years around the city, when I go somewhere, uh, I'm pretty well labeled up. And uh, people say, you're from Grain Valley? And I say, yeah. And they say, well, we've been there. We've heard of you. It's, the track has seemed to really got recognition around Kansas City. Uh, a lot of businesses have come to Grain Valley, big businesses, just because of the track. So I think you all need to consider that, and possibly more big businesses would come to Grain Valley. Thank you for your time. It's a question because that right. the comment about a lot of big business is coming due to the track. Specifically, what are you referring to? I consider O'Reilly and Advance a big business. Okay. You know they came here to sell lots of parts and uh, 
some other businesses. There's some other auto companies that have came here which support those businesses. All right, thank you. I'm Jim Blaine. I have Valley Laundry here in, in like Grain Valley and some other rentals. Okay, this, that, and the other. I've been involved in the racetrack, oh, since I think it was 03. I did not receive the packet you all got. So I can't imagine the amount of meetings that I've come to this very room and listened to and gone over. You had an advisory committee. Please help me on what year that was that you had the citizens advisory committee. We watched that. We heard from them. If my recollection is right, the track was go. Now, I assume that that went to the board of aldermen. I don't know how the city works. Was that ignored? Did you just waste the time of the citizens? How much more information does it really take to make a decision? I think that's one thing that I'm really kind of questioning. Uh, you guys seem like some smart people, a lot smarter than I am. But uh, this decision seems to be kind of odd and it always seems to be outweighed at every one of these meetings. And I've come to all that I knew of. I advertised very heavily in the high schools, the city, the event that the oh that the police have you know like out here at the park, I advertise with the uh, track. I mean I feel like a lot of oh I don't know how much a lot is but like a lot of my business comes out of the races because like usually race fans are um, very loyal, you know like to the people that really kind of support them, but uh, but I'm really questioning. Man, how much more info can we go over about this? I mean, it's just mind-blowing to me that we just rehash this. Well, since 03. That's been a long time ago, guys. And a lot of people have gone through here, and I'm going, what are we thinking about? I mean, you know, I guess it's time to put on your big boy and big girl shoes, make a decision, and then let's go on. But uh, it sure looks to me, or let's have an election. Let the citizens vote on it, like in this next election come up, and then just, hey, go either way. But it's time. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have any questions? <laughs> um, <laughs> you made it pretty clear. We do maybe have a question. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a comment. Okay. You know, um, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, there, there has been a lot of information going back and forth. The problem that we have is that we had a conditional use permit that was being broken. Okay? And, and that was put in place by all of those people and organizations that you, you stated. And they set that at 65 decibels, okay, at the property line. We're going off what does the conditional use permit say. I don't disagree that we need to, to look into this and make it to where Mr. Shrout can possibly continue to do business. But that's why we're here. We're here to make it to where he can and he's not breaking any city, city regulations. You know, and we can all do this together and, and get this moving forward. That's why we're here. That's why we're having And I appreciate that, Jim. I, you know, like I really do. And, um, but, uh, but, man, you know, I mean, Grand Valley is like an island or like a ship at sea. I don't know if anybody's in the Navy, but, man, you're just there by yourself, and we're surviving in kind of a rough economy. I don't care what they say. And we, we have an identity. Like a lot of people come in that laundromat and go, oh, gee, what's our identity? Uh, okay, we've got RV places lined up along the highway. We have, I mean, semi places. I mean, selling semis. We've got two auto parts stores, th three race tracks. Oh, the idea we have here. Chuck, we've got, we're a transportation community. What else are we? You know, let's just look at it. No, we're not an antique store community. 
man, let's let's kind of face what we're doing. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So if Thank I could you. just piggyback off what Mr. Fleischer said, um, we are here to try to work something out. And so um, just, again, I'd encourage you to keep your comments very concise. I don't want to make this a big political uh, hullabaloo. So um, we are really trying to make work out something between so we can empower Mr. Shroud to continue. But we want to make sure that the rules, whatever they are recommended, are clear. So thanks, sir. My name is Brian Shroud. I live at 1301 Northwest Cedar Lane here in Wayne Valley. Um, what I'd like to point out to the board is what the track's become. In 2008, the track was purchased as a racetrack. Uh, and since that time, you know, when, when it was bought and I started going out there, um, that's all I saw that was a racetrack. Over the years, it's become way more than that. Uh, with the community, um, we have kids out there all the time. It's like uh, the gentleman earlier said, it's more of a destination place now. Families from all over is, um, you know, far out Topeka, Kansas, make the drive out to Grain Valley every single week to race out there. Um, and it's kind of it's kind of taken on a whole new meaning uh, since when we first started. You know, it, it was just about the racing. And now uh, any given weekend, you can look at the schedule out there, and there's some type of community event, fundraiser, or something like that that's going on that draws attention to the city of Grain Valley and the, and the cooperation that the people in the city are. Um, you know, and they're out there not only spending their money at the racetrack, they're donating, and it just it puts a good light on the city. It shows the generosity that this city has um, to the less fortunate out there. Um, you know, when we started these meetings uh, two or three years ago going over this permit, one of the biggest complaints was um, racing two nights in all the races that were out there. Uh, last year, he's cut the schedule back almost in half of what it was. Um, what he's proposing um, for the, the CUP is reasonable. Uh, from what I've been to, I've been to all these meetings. A lot of it is what the citizens have asked for. They asked, you know, they, they didn't like two nights racing. It's been cut back to, you know, almost one night with a little bit of Friday sprinkled in here. Um, you know, I, I think we're at a point now where the board has something they can vote on that not only works for the track, it works for the citizens, too, because they're meeting the expectation of what the citizens have asked for in the meetings I've been to. And that's, you know, I, I just um, encourage you guys to listen to what he's saying and, and get this thing going where we quit spinning our wheels and get on down the road. Questions? All right, thanks, sir. My name is Stan Kirstein, Jr. I live at 513 South or uh, Northwest Willow Drive in Grain Valley. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, I've always been for the track. Uh, it really is a family destination, you know. I've taken my kids out there since they were young. My son's going to be turning 13 here in May, and it just happens to fall on a Saturday night. He said, Dad, can I have my birthday party at Valley Speedway? I said, sure, I'll talk to him and we'll uh, get something lined up for you. So, you know, so many kids out there and so much, you know, what it brings to something for a family to do together. You know, there, you know, racing is something that is in a lot of people's blood. It's been there for years. And uh, as far as people from coming from all different places, I know of a guy that, dra that races an A-Mod division that he, he comes down all the way from Iowa every week. He came down here to race. And uh, other than... I, I had something else to say, but lost my train, train of thought. So, uh, other than that, just I just hope everything can be worked out. You know, there is some noise, but you know what? You, anything that comes out here can be noise. You know, and sometimes when the racetrack isn't going, you know, this, the sand rags are going. The sand rags are louder than the actual race. The you know, nights we'll be sitting out there at the racetrack, and they'll have a national event going on at the sand drags, and a couple of them cars go down the sand drags, they drown out the noise from the racetrack. 
So, whatever it is, you know, it's just, I just want to say, you know, thank you for having the racetrack here. I hope it's able to continue to stay here and uh, we can all work together. You know, it's, it's just a great family place. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Douglas Mellon of Belton, Missouri. Um, if we take this race track away, where are the kids going to go? They're going to go out street racing, endangering people's lives? What about every, all the kids that want to go have fun? Where are they going to go? Nowhere. Except sit at home, maybe go to the movie theater, make them rich. But not all kids want to go sit down, sit on their butt, and watch TV. They can do that at home playing video games. They want to go outdoor, play in an environment where it's fun. Have enjoyment time. That's all I gotta say. That's right up. My name's Robert Grove. I actually live in Blue Springs, but I've been a direct TV technician in this area for a little over five years. Um, I do a lot of work in the Green Valley area. I've probably been in some of your homes. I've did so many jobs, all the faces and people kind of run together. But in the five years I've been installing, I have not had one customer say anything negative about the track. It's all been positive. Um, <clears throat> I'd say the airport, <laughs> the train track has been the biggest concern. Um, you know, it's kind of short and sweet, but I mean, just... You know, a little over five years and hardly no complaints. I just, you know, think that speaks for itself. Thank you. Before you get started. <clears throat> Mr. Groves, so the, the complaints you've heard about the track and the airport, what have what have you heard about that in comparison? Well, just, I mean, I always ask when I go in, you know, because I'm a racer, I race out there. And I asked, you know, I'm like, does the noise bother you? And they're like, no. You know, it, you know the, the train's going off in the middle of the night, you know, for people that live closer to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the airport, you know, they didn't say, <laughs> you want to talk about rumbling some windows. <laughs> so, but yeah, they just, I just wanted to throw that out there. You know, okay. I, <laughs> and I do a lot of work, Grain Valley, Oak Grove, you know, in this area. And, you know, I think the one complaint I had was an elderly lady. I give her all brand new remotes. She still complained. So <laughs> <laughs> there was no pleas in that. One, so you know, but anyway, that's just my two. You stuff. tried. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I guess <clears throat> Norm Combs, one zero zero eight Southwest Foxtail Drive. Wake up, Scott. <laughs> Put your name down, Norm. Uh, the last gentleman beat me to the uh, the noise from the airport. Back in '03, when uh, when the track opened up, the uh, noise level was a little high in my neighborhood because they didn't have any mufflers on it, and it persisted. But I guess it, the sound of it was different. But if you're gonna want your Flowers pollinated. You got to put up with the bumblebees, and that's a little bit different. Something like <clears> that. Uh, the airport <clears throat> had more noise than the track ever did, because I've heard uh, planes flying after dark, early in the morning, when I'm trying to sleep. The train track, the railroads, the trains, with their whistles blowing through town before 6 a.m., and I'm old, I like to get my sleep, and if I get awakened, I can't get back to sleep. You know how it goes, Scott. You're there. <laughs> I-70, you have traffic on there, uh, but it's normal noise. People put up with it. The, uh, the airport is a destination if you happen to have an airplane. The railroad is, I mean, some people like to go down and watch the trains go by. 
It's just in their nature. They don't spend a lot of money doing it, though. But our track is one of the few destinations we have in town. We have the Brass Armadillo. I've heard people say, oh, you live out where, where the Brass Armadillo is. Oh, you live out by where Whiskey Tango. I don't think we can have too many destinations. But last summer, is my time up? Last summer, the uh, racing season was halfway over with before I realized that we had a racing season. Because Mr. Shroud had them put some mufflers on, on the cars. And uh, that, to me, it's the noise is just something that's not normal. And that's why people complain. It's not because they're sexually loud. Uh, back in 03, they had trouble stopping the races on time because they kept running over and beyond the 10 or 11 o'clock, whatever the cutoff was. But uh, again, nothing wrong with having a destination here in town. And a lot of people like it. Thank you. And I'm open for questions. I don't have any answers, but I'm open to questions. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Dawn Mason. I live in South Blue Springs. And I just want to say that having this track open, when I was a kid and as a teenager, I grew up with the old lakeside and then had to drive out to the new lakeside. And when my significant other, which is the direct TV technician back there, found out that Lake that Valley Speedway was out here, it was wonderful. I have two boys at home that like to get involved in the video games, sit at home, watch TV and all of that. When we started coming to the racetrack, we were here one year watching, and the next year, this gentleman back here with his hat on is now racing at the age of 15. He's not out on the streets racing. He's not out doing drugs, drinking alcohol. I know where my kids are at every single weekend. And I think you guys really need to take that in consideration. Um, unfortunately, I'm a fr uh, friend of uh, Grain Valley's resident site on Facebook, and I'm seeing there's a lot of crime going on. Cars getting broken into, houses getting broken into. That's another thing with the Speedway. We're open at odder hours of the evening that most of your people aren't around here, so it's going to keep the traffic moving and possibly get rid of your problem here in Grain Valley of, you know, obviously in the summertime, but not in the winter, but in the summertime that could help the more traffic you have coming through. That's it. All right, thank you. Are there public comments? Okay, so before we close that portion and turn it over to Mr. Shroud, um, I know this is a pretty pro-track crowd, but I don't want to exclude anybody. Uh, is anyone against the idea, just so we know, without having to make comment? I don't want to put you on the spot. But. Okay. Good deal. All right, so let's move on. Uh, Mr. Shroud, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. If you'd like to uh, take some time to make some comments to us. Hey, uh, I, I know it's not my turn, but are the pros and the and the we're the pros, but I mean the the other ones do 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 these people show up? I mean, who's so? Um, it's a good question. Are, are, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do yeah. I believe you guys that there's legitimate complaints? But I'm just wondering, Sir, you know. If you don't mind, I'd like to address that. Sorry. Um, I've actually been doing a, spending a lot of time walking around the community and talking to a lot of the residents in Grain Valley. Um, and to be honest, I'm not hearing a lot of negative comments. I have heard a few, um, you know, and I believe that they have legitimate complaints. Um, however, not being in their living room when a race is going on, it's hard for me to say whether whether it is or is not legitimate. What I will do, what I will say is that, yes, there are some people out there that have complained about the trash. Um, there are some people out there that aren't comfortable stepping forward in a public forum to explain their concern. Um, but 
by and large, I think I've heard more support for than against. And to clarify again, we're not here, this isn't an up and down vote of whether or not the track can go forward. This is more, we're trying to work out details if it were to be able to go forward. How does that look? So I know there's a lot of comment made whether or not we're going to approve allowing racing. Um, that's not really what our purpose is here tonight. So I um, just want to mention that. So Mr. Shrout, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to people. Um, I guess the, the picture that I um, brought up there for you guys to look at is a weekly race. It was a fall event. Uh, that isn't even a national event. There's about $10 million worth of equipment represented in that picture sitting in the pits at the racetrack. I guess my what I'm trying to get through to you. This isn't a bunch of hillbilly rednecks out there that are just drinking beer and raising hell every weekend. Uh, there's a lot of money that's spent out there, and these are very influential people that spend a lot of money on this sport. Uh, and this isn't even counting the national events that we bring in. I mean, we've had Tony Stewart race at our track three different times, J.J. Yaley. I mean, we've had several NASCAR drivers come to our track to race, so I mean, I want to make it very clear that, you know, we're just not a bunch of, you know, like I said, hillbillies out there just drinking beer and, you know, causing trouble. I don't think uh, the police department, if you talk to them, they don't come out there. They don't, we don't have issues. And I guess the economic impact is something extremely important to consider, um, not trying to, I guess, devalue the city of Green Valley but there's really not a lot of reasons for anybody that doesn't live in this town to come to this town. You know, and again, I'm not taking away from anybody. There are a few places that do uh, bring people from out of town, but we bring people from all over the Midwest to come to Green Valley to watch our races. We've had events out there that come from New York just to watch races on these national events. There's a lot of people that follow these events, stay in our motels, eat here, and that's one of the reasons that whenever, uh, again, uh, Ken, I think, alluded to the fact that, you know, we would like to do at some point in time some two- and three-day events that these people will come to town and they'll stay in town for three or four days at some of these big events. So that's kind of the reason that's in there. Um, the thing that I put together to show you of what the racetrack was looking at is something that uh, I know what it takes to run a racetrack. I've done it for several years now, and uh, I guess if you guys start tearing apart what I've come up with, it's not going to work. You know, if you guys try to tear this down to where I'm not sure exactly, and I'm not saying this is what you're going to do, but uh, I tried to be conservative on what I asked for and what we needed. Uh, I'm not saying that a few of these things can't be tweaked, but uh, whenever this whole thing started, like Jim was talking about, they kept having us come to these meetings and the citizens' advisory meeting and stuff and saying we needed to work something out, and it was never worked out. I mean, whenever we had our meetings, to, whenever they had the meeting saying they were going to have a meeting to cancel our condition of use permit, the mayor asked council if we came to an agreement before that meeting, uh, they didn't have to con you know, cancel the condition of use permit. And he was said, no, if we can come in an agreement before then, we don't have to cancel it. Well, I'm not sure what happened, but, you know, uh, and Ryan, you was at that meeting at, over there. I mean, it's like we had these meetings and people got up and spoke and it, it fell on deaf ears. It never went anywhere. And I'm not sure why. Because uh, the mayor, whenever this all started, was going to go to the Citizens Advisory Committee and they was going to make their recommendations. We was going to come to you guys. You would make your recommendations and we'd go back to the city and try to come up with a compromise. That didn't happen. So if I could interrupt you for a second, just sure. to clarify. Um, not that I want to get muddled down with the history, because we want to go forward. If I understand. Can, but, um, so the CUP, the, the agreement time, that period you guys were trying to work something out, was that to modify the CUP at that time, or? That's what I understood, yes. OK, so there were changes still that need to be made, kind of like we're doing tonight. Correct, Okay. without canceling it. Okay, I guess that was my <clears throat> what I was trying to clarify because if there was a modification, it would seem like, and maybe this is more of a 
legal question that it would I then revoke the, the old PUC. I mean, well, what, what happened, happened was, I mean, I think what you're talking about are the meetings that we had in like July of 2013 over at the community center and yeah. the, the citizens committee, um, that there was discussion about trying to modify the CEP um, without the revocations. Um, we weren't able to get a modification agreed to. Um, and then, so the board went forward with the revocation hearing last summer. But, and at the revocation hearing, um, part of the direction that the Board of Aldermen gave to city staff was to try to um, work out a new conditional use permit. And so that's where we're at. Well, I, I guess, again, I'm not trying to be combative or argumentative, but you said we couldn't come to an agreement. It never went anywhere. It never came up to even for discussion after the Citizens Advisory Committee and they made their recommendations and the next step was we were supposed to come to here and that came straight from the mayor. We was gonna have two meetings, citizens advisory, come to the zoning board and then back to the city for a compromise. And none of that stuff happened. I mean, I don't wanna get bogged down in it because I think that we well, do want to go forward. I mean, but I mean, I, I but I mean, we, uh, I mean we went through this at the, that the revocation guys, hearing about the we discussion. Could, I'm gonna uh, interrupt here because I don't wanna get muddled down. All right, I understand, I understand. I so, just, I just, I just wanted to give you some history of no, what I, has I, happened in the I past. Asked, so. I appreciate that. Um, so not to, because uh, I want to keep the spirit of I understand. working out something going forward here. I Let's agree. Table that for however remedy you want to okay. affix to that. Um, but thanks for clarifying. So keep going. Okay. Uh, I guess the, the economic benefit, I have had Casey's send me letters basically stating that they don't have three Casey stores in any town, in, the, in any place that they do business in the country except Grain Valley because of Valley Speedway. They said had they known that there was issues with the Speedway, they probably would have not built the store that's out here on the side of town, that they count on that racetrack to bring in business for their stores. They built the new store out here where they moved just across the street. The reason they did that was because they couldn't hold enough gas ice and uh, beverages for the race fans during race season. So they built a new store across the street to accommodate the race fans. The regional manager from McDonald's came to, out to the racetrack and talked to me about what was going on here. And he said, you know, whenever we put our McDonald's store in Grain Valley, one of the things at the top of our list is what other incidental business are we gonna get besides the residents in a town that are gonna stop and buy our product? And he said, Valley Speedway was number one of why we came here because the business that the Speedway brings in in season is what we count on for profit. And the same thing with O'Reilly. He said that the reason that O'Reilly's is out on that end of town is because of racetracks on that end of town. So, I mean, the economic benefit, I don't know how much weight it carries into this, but it's pretty high. And it's, you know, there's a lot of income that's brought in uh, because of the racetrack. And it's like, um, I forget who said something, uh, that you know, the, the dollars that he was talking about are gross dollars, but just because it's not sales tax, those businesses count on the income to make a living. You know, it's not all about the sales tax. I mean, the income that's brought into the business that they count to pay their light bill, to pay their taxes, is also income that's needed for them to be prosperous. So, uh, again, just keeping that in mind, uh, it's not all about the sales tax, even though that's a big part of it. The income to these businesses is substantial. And I work for O'Reilly part-time, helping deliver parts. Uh, they're one of my sponsors at the racetrack. And I talk to a lot of businesses in town. And I, I always ask, I said, you know, hey, I'm, I own Valley Speedway. What's your thoughts on it? I've never had one negative comment. They all think that it's great, that it brings income, and it's good for the city. So, uh, again, just the economic benefit. And also, I think I was talking earlier, whenever you look at some of these sound issues, we've done sound issue after study after sound study. Uh, I think we've got more than enough data to where you guys can make an intelligent decision based on the data, not on what anybody's saying or, you know, some of the stuff that said is just absurd, you know, in the past. So uh, we, I haven't heard any of that tonight, but in the past, the, some of the stuff that's in the, the packet that he gave you, I mean, there's people complaining about the fumes from the track. I mean, there's 80,000 cars going down I-70. Come on. You know, the racetrack with 25, 30 cars on it at weekends, that's, that's reaching. Is there any, I mean, any questions that anybody has, I'd be more than happy to. 
I have a question. The main thing I hear from residents is noise. It, and the best way I can explain it, if we had the air conditioning system cut on right now in the middle of our conversation, it would be disruptive to our meeting if it was extremely loud. Granted, it might, might only last three or four minutes, but that's three or four minutes where we're going to have to talk louder, where we have a little bit of discomfort level, where something could be misconstrued being said in a manner um, that it wasn't intended because we had to speak louder. I think the citizens are concerned about the noise level. What can we do from the city's end, from your end, to minimize the impact of the noise? Some of it we can't change. We are Grain Valley. There is a valley here. We have residents that sit higher than the speedway. The sound travels. We all know that. I live in, um, where do I live? Woodbury. And I can hear the, I can hear the speedway. But if I go up the street and around the corner, it's much louder because of the way the sound travels across the terrain. I don't we, know that there's answers to fix all We that. did a sound study, the, and it was we did a sound study on a Friday night that we weren't racing. This was just this fall, and on Saturday night when we were racing, and did right there at Woodbury where that pond is, huh? we tried to pick the, the place that the, the noise would be the loudest, where there was nothing in front of it, no houses, right there where that pond is, and the difference between Saturday night when we were racing and Friday night when we were not racing was three decibels. That, and I'm not saying that you can't hear it, but no. just because you can hear it don't mean it's offensive. And that's part of the problem. If people can hear the racetrack for whatever reason, well, it's offensive because they can hear it. And that's what reason I said look at the sound studies because what a lot of these people are saying it just doesn't, it's not, it doesn't hold facts. You know, you can hear the track, but three decibels, if you look at any sound study, three decibels undetectable to the human ear. A human ear can't detect three decibels. So if you're listening and you, somebody turns something up three decibels, you can't really tell. So, and that was the difference, and that was over a six hour period. We left this sound meter on. It wasn't just a handheld meter that somebody stand there with. We left it on for six full hours, and it was three decibels difference. And I understand what you're saying about people mentioning that they can hear the track, but just because you can hear it don't mean it's offensive. And whenever you look at some... Actually, offensive is so subjective. Well, and then, if I'm the, the one trying to go to sleep, then I find it offensive. Yeah, well, and the definition of noise is unwanted sound. So, right. I mean, if you go to Washington, there's a lot of noise, so, you know. <laughs> It's a racetrack, is all, you know, and it's been there. The conditional use permit was issued 10 years ago. Uh, I try to be as good of a neighbor as I can possibly be. We do fundraisers out there constantly, food drives. We try to give back to the community. We give the school tickets. Uh, we've helped them with their booster club, giving them tickets to come out and sell them and keep the money. So uh, we're very community-minded, and uh, it's whenever we race, you're going to hear it. But it, just because it's three decibels higher doesn't mean it's an offensive noise. I mean, but I understand what you're saying. I've got a few questions, Mr. Um, first question: In the past, how many weeknights were you running? Like? Whenever we first opened up, every Saturday, actually every Friday, and then uh, we switched to every Saturday when uh, CMS closed. And then for two years, we raced Friday and Saturday. We ran an open wheel program Friday night and a uh, stock car program on Saturday night. Last year, uh, or two years ago, we went back to just strictly racing Saturdays and raced one Friday a month. And I think it came up to about 35 to 38 races, something like now, that. I'm more specifically asking about the weekday nights, so like the Wednesdays, Thursdays. I've never raced more than three times during the week ever. Ever. How many times in a season? Three times. Oh, just three times. Oh, total. three total. Uh, yeah. I've never ever three. raced more than three times in any given year. Okay. You notice on, on this year's uh, program, I think there's two Wednesdays. Okay. Um, just from my understanding of what you're asking for when you say sound measured 100 feet behind the car to find at three to 4,000 RPM. How many RPM is typically a vehicle running when it's going around a track? Six to 7,000 RPMs. And I, we aren't making these figures up. I've called racetracks all over the United States. So, I mean, these things that you see on here are what other tracks are doing. 
I mean, I, I'm not just sitting out there at the racetrack making stuff up. I'm trying to base what we need to do on what other tracks are doing. So that's that's kind of – and Brian Brown, you've got a national caliber race car driver right here in Green Valley. That I mean, he's a world-renowned race car driver, and that's what he said. When they go to out-of-town tracks, and most people say all these tracks are out in the current in the middle of nowhere, that's not right. Most of these big race tracks are right in the middle of town every place they're at. And he said that's how they check them. they got a rope they put on them. They get a sound meter, they go out 100 feet, and you have to be under that decibel reading to race. If you're not under that decibel reading, you can't race. Um, no, and, and that's fine. I'm just asking questions just for my question. I understand. I'm, okay, that's fine. Um, okay, I know one of the things that you've said quite frequently is that, you know, you don't intend to be any louder. You don't want to do any more than what you're currently doing. So then why are you asking for 90 decibels when what you're measuring at is 75.5? It depends on how you take the reading. I mean... The reading that that you take, most of the tracks, I didn't find any track that was under, I think, 85 decibels was the lowest track I found anywhere. Knox, just to give you an example, Knoxville, which is a major track in the United States, is 104. That's their, that's what their their decibel reading is. So, I mean, it's it's how you make it. The the, the way we took these readings was a time weighted average, and. If you go out there with the sound meter, if you look on there, it shows the spikes of the, what the highest reading is. So, I mean, it's all going to depend on how you take it. And that's the reason I came up with the thing with the muffler. It's an easy way to take it and make sure the cars, each individual car, is where they need to be. To do a sound study, I mean, you're talking a lot of time and a lot of money to do one of these sound studies and do it right. So I was trying to come up with something that we could do to make sure if an out-of-town driver came in, we could check its car and make sure that it's quiet enough that we're not we're not going to go over our decibel readings. So as to that, because I had the same question, um, unless Ken misspoke, it, it sounded like you guys both agreed that the LEQ method was the agreed upon method, the average time method, which, if I'm reading this right, is the lower bar on these graphs. Um, and so if we if we're talking about the track here not elsewhere, um, it does look like you never even go above 80 or that 75 and a half lines, I guess, is what you guys were talking about. So I guess justify for us, if you would, why the extra 15 decibels there. In the fall, when the leaves are off the trees and in the spring, you're going to have probably a five to seven decibel higher reading than what this is. Uh, the direction the wind's blowing is going to have a impact on the sound. Uh, just trying to come up with something that I don't want to be up here again doing this again. I would like this to be the last time I have to do this. And Technology changes. I'm assuming if there's a better muffler out there, I don't have a problem of going to a better muffler. You know, I, I don't want the citizens of this town to not like the track. I got no reason to have anybody hate the track, so uh, I will do what I can to continue to keep it. Most of those sound readings you're looking at came from whenever we called other tracks. That's where we pulled them from. You know, and if the city goes out there with a little handheld meter you know, they're going to get those spikes at 85 to 90 decibels. That's where they're going to be at with, you know, the handheld meters that they use. So that's kind of what we're looking at. If they're going to be out there with a handheld meter, you're going to have to have it where those spikes are at, if that's how you're going to take it. You know, the time-weighted average, the highway department, in just about every, everybody uses a time-weighted average over one hour, two hour, three hour, and some of it's a 24-hour period. So it, the, the way you take those readings is a huge difference on where they need to be. Um, another question that I had was, okay, so the graphs that we're looking at are based off a one-minute time-weighted average, correct? Is that what you, or is that three minutes? One. One minute time the, Well, the one, the last we did was one. The one that they did before that the city had done was a three-minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so why are we asking for a one-hour time-weighted average versus... We can, whatever, however you want to take the sound reading, it just needs to be something that I can live with. Okay. You know, if, if so we do a test, it needs to be done. I, I want to know, if we do a sound test, I want to know how it's going to be taken. And 
that seems to, I've never, I haven't found anything that's under one hour time weighted average. Of all the <coughs> tests I looked on, I didn't find any under that. And most of them are around three, a three hour time weighted average. Was that for racetracks? In general. Construction sites, it's just something that the um, EPA and anybody that's concerned about sound, it's the way they take the test. Okay. OSHA, I mean, there's pretty much everybody has a, a little variation on it, but they're all pretty close to the same. What is, and again, I know it was said earlier, but just for clarification, what's the current curfew that you run, you run by? There is no. What do you typically shut down by? I never have went past 11 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, the checkered flag comes out. <clears throat> I'm done. Okay. Now, when you do your races, is it, is it and I'm going to be honest, I don't go to races very often. Um, but for my clarification, when you do your races, do you have several different types of mods? Do you have different classes, rather? We run usually four classes of car, four to five classes of cars. And so you'll run the louder classes first and then? We run the quietest class of cars last. Okay. The, the loudest cars are the cars that people come to see, the feature class, and we run those next to last. And they're, I don't think we ever went past 10 o'clock this year with our feature class. The only, the only time we might go past 10 o'clock with a feature class, if it's a special where it's basically all it may be every car out there may be a feature class where you're you've got 60 or 70 cars of the same class and you got to do qualifying and stuff so that would be the only time that you would probably have the louder cars that went through the whole program you wouldn't have a quiet class to run last so one concern the city had was the if I heard this right the 1,200 foot from center property line. How do you answer that? The only place that we have a problem with the sound reading is on the north property line, and that's the that's the place that is closest to the track. Uh, if you look at the the sounds that the city did, there's two of the spots that are over 1,200 feet property line, or over 1,200 feet. I would just like to come up with a point. To where if it's if it's a thousand feet, twelve hundred feet, I don't care what it is, but that's where we take it. Every place, you know, on the north side of the track, I mean, you can get within, you know, four or five hundred feet of the track. You know, it's a it's a industrial area, M1 zoning. There's no houses there, so if you push it out to a thousand or twelve hundred feet, you know, it's I'm not stuck on twelve hundred feet. The only reason I come up twelve hundred feet, there's two points at the track that are over twelve hundred. So I was trying to just come up with an average to where whenever we take it. No matter where we're at, it's not that we're louder at the north boundary line, it's we're closer to the sound at the north boundary line. We're not louder over there, it's closer to where we're taking the test. I had to laugh a little bit at you, Jim. Your idea of an average of 1,200 feet is kind of funny to me, just because on the north side and the south side, you're looking at just a few hundred foot boundary line. I agree that we need to come up with something. I'm looking at, at the, the boundary line here. So from the center of the track to the north boundary line is maybe 300 feet. Mm -hmm. And from the center of the track to the south boundary line, again, is a little bit less than 300 feet. Um, if you look at the south boundary line where you come off the freeway, it's about 1,400 feet. If you go all the way out and then back around, yes. But if you go straight to the boundary line, like the sound will travel, because it's not going to go down the road and take a left. The boundary line of this current conditional use permit is the road, is 40 highway, 40 highway. and it's about 1,400 feet. Okay. That is the current, I say, the, the, the CUP that was just canceled, that it was the boundary line of the entire property that went out to 40 highway. Okay, which is about 1,200 feet. Correct. Okay. So I agree really the one that we're looking at, is the biggest issue is going to be that north boundary line. Um, for the city, in the past, where have you done your measurements from? I mean, as close as we could get north, south, east, and west to the uh, property lines. I'm going to pass out a, because we throw out this 1,200 feet thing, just so you know what 1,200 feet is. Am 
might not be exact on the center, but it's pretty close. Nope. When you look at it, and this is one of the things when we talk about not having control over some of those things that change if we did the 1,200 feet, when this whole thing started, that was basically all one property, that entire area that's there. So football fields, the sand drags, the, the valley speedway, that was all one property under one owner. And you know, like Dennis bought the racetrack and everything else has kind of been divided up. So going forward, I mean, I think it makes the reason we think the property line like number makes sense and that's what we need to figure out what the proper sound reading would be there that's not going to change you're bounded by the railroad tracks there on the north that property line is not going to change in the south that's going to be hard pressed to change now that would go into the sand drags um the east and west that's kind of what it's been i mean to answer your question basically the end of harris street there was kind of the considered the west property line when we did the test um, and then east I mean you basically have to try you have to go through uh, Mr. Shrout's property to get back there um, when we did the last uh, sound study we went out with uh, Mr. Shrout's consultant and it to go to the east one I mean, we would basically do go all the way across there and cross the creek and try to find that that property line um, but when we we talked about the already having data that was one of the reasons that I included these studies in there is because the north line is close and that's where these are taken from so we know what that number is when we start moving that out I, who knows what that I mean just uh, like Miss Saffle sitting in her neighborhood there it's not she can hear it at her house it's not real loud when she talks about going around the corner it's not that big of a subdivision to be able to change that that level and it's kind of with this if we go from being at the north property line right now and we go out to that 1200 feet there it just seems to me like we'd be going down a path where we don't know exactly what it is that we're we're dealing with well and there'll never be houses there it's all m1 zoning it's industrial area i mean i'm not sure what well i not, guess what point are you trying to make that you know if you want to come up here to the closest property line I mean, I don't think that's hardly fair to the racetrack to try my, to get as close as you can to take From a staff point of view, that's where these numbers came from, from your consultant. They were at that north But line. if we make it 1,000 feet or 1,200 feet to where it's the same no matter where we take it at, I mean... I think what he might be getting at is we don't know what 1,000 feet out numbers are. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, we don't. So, sure we do. Sure do we, we do. do we, we, got we got three points that are over 1,000 feet. Or a thousand feet. There's three points that are a thousand feet. At the same time, we know that it now doesn't go the same way each direction. I mean, that's like the. Mm. If that was the case, it would have been the same at 40 Highway or old 40 Highway as it was at Harris. It, yeah, it has trees. I mean, there's going to be there's going to be things that come in. Yeah. But if you take a thousand feet or whatever the number is from the racetrack, it's going to be the same measurement no matter where you take it. I mean, if you're going to try to take it to the closest point to the racetrack, I mean, what's the point of taking it anywhere else? Where did you see that? Point me out the thousand feet numbers, because I don't. I may have just overlooked it, but. If. Mm -hmm. The meters were set up there. There. Actually. There. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> actually, it's, it's close to 1,200. Okay. That's, if you look at where we took the sound study, that okay. the only one that's different. Is that one. All right. So I don't know if we're making a record, but um, Mr. Shrout has marked a couple places on the map that city provided out towards the circumference of the circle. My question, I guess, was more directed to. I don't know how we decide this any other way. Um, that you guys have provided decibel numbers based upon property line, but we don't have any decibel numbers, or I don't have it in front of me anyway. Maybe we do um, for where those studies were taken. That might be helpful to see those. 
if you look, well, the, the one down here is the south study, the one over here is the west study, east study, and north study. If you just look at the map, the, the sound readings were taken north, east, south, and west is how we determined it. It's got a property line. I didn't get this information until just tonight, so uh, I haven't had a chance to look at what he's given you. Yeah, it is, and that's what. Let me talk about this, Ken. Okay. When Mr. Shroud and the city started talking about, you know, how we're going to measure decibels, because the, the problem is, is that it's so dynamic, depending on where you go to measure it. So what we did was, um, Dennis and Ken and I talked about what's the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario for Valley Speedway is the north property line. That's where the sound readings have always been the highest because it's the closest to the track. And so as we were trying to move through this, we didn't want to compare apples to oranges and say, well, we know at 400 feet it's 75.5, so let's bump it out to 1,200 and guess that it's you know, 70. I mean, we wanted the right. concrete data that we had. And I think what may be getting lost here is that we're not trying to move the sound readings in any closer. We're just trying to tie it to the concrete data that we have from the sound studies. Right. This was a this was a feature race A mods with 20 cars on the track. It's not going to get any louder than that down there. I mean, it, it just isn't. So we're not trying to encroach closer to the racetrack. We're just trying to tie it back to some concrete data that we have and put that in the CUP. So if that means that it needs to reflect it can't exceed on the north property line. I mean, we know that's the problematic area. Uh, it doesn't matter what it's reading down on 40 Highway because we can always go straight to that north property line and know where it's going to be the loudest at. Because that's the worst case scenario. Correct. Okay. All right. Question for the city. Where are the complaints coming from as a general direction? All over the city, a north direction, a south Just is there, is there some way of... Well, and that was kind of the other part of this when he said the worst case because that historically has been where most of the complaints are coming from is from the north. We've, I mean, I don't know, most of these meetings, we've had very few from south or west that have come to complain. So when trying to put something together in a new permit that makes sense for everybody, that's why we've gone to this north line, because we have numbers now that Mr. Shrout's uh, sound expert put together and measured, so we know that that's there, because that's kind of been the thing all along is, you know, where do these numbers come from? It's just, just, we just threw a number at it. Well, that's what we've tried to do is we, we have, we feel like this is good data that uh, Mr. Shrout's consultant came up with. So let's run with that number, that's, or that spot, uh, and with these numbers that we have, come up with something that works. Because that is where most of the problems have, have come from. Okay, for Mr. Shrout, I've been to a couple races. I know you got semi set up out there for noise. Is there some, and I don't know, is there some way of, Buffering even more on the north side. Just put in a hundred thousand dollar sound wall. I don't know. I understand that, but uh, I don't know. Again, understand what everybody's saying. The com place where most of the complaints are coming from, there's a three decibel difference. Keep that in mind. It's just because they can hear it. You know, they can call a complaint, and they'll still call a complaint, I'm sure. But there's three decibels difference. In the Woodbury subdivision, that's where most of the complaints come from, uh, there was three decibels difference between the night we didn't race and the night we did race, taking one night apart, took one Friday and one Saturday. Uh, I'm sure in the future, that, I mean, I will continue to do what I can to make it quieter. i got no reason to be before anybody talking about sound. I mean, that's the reason I want to get this at some place I know I can live with, you know. If you're looking at these numbers, if you're going to take it exactly the way we took it, all I would say is you need to be five to seven decibels above where this is in case there's a strong south wind the night they take it. If it's cold, if there's no leaves on the trees, you know, don't screw it down to where best case scenario, this is where you got to be. You know, that would be all the only input or the main input I would have on from a sound issue. If you want to make it the north boundary line is where we're going to take it at, I would guess, I'm, they took it at Harris Street, which probably, if you look at Harris Street, uh, no, let's do with that. when we went out there, oh, I can show you here, when we went out with Mr. Licktide, we actually came like in this 
little spur right there. Yeah, it's actually the right on the north side. So it's not even technically your property line. It's the, the north right-of-way line for the railroad track. And it's just kind of an open field there is where we put the, the monitor on the post. That is the closest place to the track you can get without coming across railroad tracks, I guess, and Her taking Her it Her on Street. my site, yeah. Well, no. it's actually, uh, it's closer than Harris Street. It's probably, Harris Street could be another, what, 150, 200 feet past where you guys took it? That well, Harris would be the west line. That's I'm further sorry, south and west. I'm talking about um, the one that goes down past the city. James uh, Rollo. James Rollo, yeah. On the north side. Yeah, it's right there where the railroad tracks, right? Right on the other side of the railroad tracks is the closest spot. Yeah, Harris Street is about a 1,200 foot to Harris Street, right. approximately. Right. How it's taken. Well, I think we've all just agreed on how it's going to be taken. And that's going to be yeah. LHC. But well, still, the time, it's. Time, the, the time period, the weighted average. Yeah. Like I said, I think the city, they, it was, they, they was using a three minute. And Correct. We used a one minute whenever we did it. Every, every minute, it took a sound reading, I mean, for six hours. We took a sound reading every minute for six hours is what we did on a race night and a non-race night. We did one Friday night and then one Saturday night is what we did. So, so then, what, go ahead, Jan. So what you're saying for the one hour time wait is you'll take a, a reading every minute for an hour and then average that together and then that's what you're... That is what I proposed. I mean, I think that what you guys are looking at was a spike. You were guys looking at the spikes. Is that what you were doing? No, the numbers that they're going off of are what, when we had Mr. Licktide just look at the feature events, because the thing that we think needs to be monitored is what the sound is when the races are going on. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole issue. So, and what you have in front of you and what planning and zoning have, it's just exactly what your consultant sent us. So that yellow area, that's why the feature races are actually going on. So they vary in time. I mean, I think one you had eight yellows, so the race was 36 minutes long. Right. And the next one's maybe six. So that's where we had thought, you know, the three-minute uh, averaging would work. And, yeah, basically it's, it's taking out the highs and the lows in that three-minute period. So you get an average. You're not getting penalized for, one, you know, one loud noise. Uh, it's not going to throw everything off. Um, Looks like the... The highest one was just right at 85 decibels, is that correct? Looking at your data on July the 16th on the north property line, just right um, under 85 no, decibels. No, oh. I don't, no, the highest LEQ is 75 and a half. And I would clarify, this is not our data. This is what Mr. Licktide There, what the peak is, that, yeah, that but we're was, not looking at the peak. Yeah. That was okay, but that was the LEQ for that time weighted average for that distance. Correct. Which is going to be hard to. So it. The high reading for that race was right at 85 decibels. Correct. On the bottom chart there. 75. I don't know. Yeah, I'm well, not. on July 16th, North Property Line, July 16th. Yeah. The race. Can you show me what you're looking at? I'm at 85 anyway. No, we're not. We're looking at his little summary here, actually. What he called the excluded zone is everything in that yellow. So he's saying that there was a peak of 104, but we're not looking at that. We're looking at the LEQ, the which the is. Yellow is a race event, right? Yes. Okay, and during that race event, the peak sound for one minute was right at 85. Mm -hmm. So this 104 must have been a second interval. No. Cause remember, I'm looking at this one here. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking at. The average time weighted average for this distance was 71 decibels, but the highest peak was 85. Right there. Yeah, but 
Yeah, but that's what's up here. Mm -hmm. The excluded, that's the reason it's a little louder, is because that's when the cars were actually out there during that time. If somebody went down to the Hound Hill meter and did a way to get a one minute reading, it's going to be 85. And that's what, yeah, that's why we're saying we don't think that it would be, that's why we were saying a three minute interval, because it's not going to take into, like, for that. You got 36 minutes there, so your your three minute average is going to happen quite a few times. 12, 12 times. But what I'm saying, how are you going to take these readings? How are you? Gonna... You can actually do that with the handheld things. Right, but it's going to be 85. Hmm. That's not a three minute. It's that's actually going to go more into your favor, the three minute average rather than a one minute average. But again, this this is a one minute average at 85. There's a peak there, yeah. Okay. But that's not what we're looking at the whole... I understand like, what you're saying, but again, if you're out there with a handheld meter, and you want to do... If it's three minutes, it's going to be a little bit lower than that, maybe mm -hmm. one decimal and a decimal and a half. But again, what I'm trying to determine is, if you're going to take a handheld meter out there at that north property line, it's going to need to be close to 85 decimals <coughs> if you're going to handheld meter, because... You're not going to take it for that time. You're going to take it for that time. And, and keep in mind, too, we throw out the three-minute thing. I mean, that's something that how we take it is up for discussion. If we do the, if we're going lengths of races or however you want to, I mean, the big thing that we're going after is what is the sound when the races are going on. Right. And so I don't, I mean, that's not going to act like we are the sound. We're going off of what people have given us. But with that 85, using, there was an 85, Maybe. He also broke this down into seconds at one point, though, too. Hmm. Represents one minute. Yeah. And they connect, is what. But, I mean, for that one minute, that it was at, again, it's not quite 80, but 85 decibels. Kind of right. So, for one minute, we had a sustained level of 85 decibels. Right, and that's what I don't. I wouldn't even recommend going for a one-minute thing like that. Okay. I just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. that we're going to be out there because you're going to get three minutes. Three minutes is probably going to be lower, maybe decimal, decimal and a half. So I just I want to make sure that if we're going to use the north boundary line, I don't want to be up here again. I want something I can leave. Anybody does. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> I don't think we, any of us want to do this again, do we? Yeah, no. <laughs> and, uh, again, to reiterate, springtime, no leaves, cold weather, it's going to be five to seven decibels higher. Okay. You know, so whatever you see on there, had it been a cold spring or cold fall, you'd probably somewhere five to seven decibels higher than what you're seeing there. Just, again... You FYI. mentioned that these readings were taken over a six-hour period. Do you know right. roughly the time that the six hours occurred? It was from that it right there? four o'clock. Mm -hmm. No, it was five o'clock to eleven o'clock. It went to our curfew. Thank you. Five. Really. Both of them the same way. The, the the Friday night they were both identical tests from that time period, and we did them in four different spots. He just shows you the north one here. We actually did them, actually five spots. We did north, south, east, west, property line at the racetrack, and then the Woodbury one, uh, we did, the, that was the fifth one we did during that. And the city, you, you have all that information, don't you? Yeah, we did, and like Mr. Hunt said earlier, we kind of put this one out there just because it is the worst right. case. I understand. Yeah. And just to clarify from the city's point, you guys agree with what I understood with that discussion that, like for instance, July 16th, it is moving up close to the 85 mark. Yeah, and it's going to depend on how we want to do that. If we want to, okay. I mean, if you take a one-minute average and you want to say it's for that race event and you average those one-minute times, that's something that could be done. I mean, I think that's the point of tonight is getting an agreement on what mm -hmm. what everybody's comfortable with as far as measuring 
that sound, so there is no question going forward. The May 17 races seem to be quite a bit quieter. So. Yeah, I think that July 16th race was a, uh, that was our loudest class of cars, because we were wanting to get some kind of an idea of worst case scenario. Like I said, I, I, want, to, I want to have it this to where worst case scenario that I'm not breaking my conditional use permit mm -hmm. should we come to an agreement on one. Kim, what, what's the difference between this conditional use permit and, and the one that the, the Board of Aldermen uh, revoked? What, what's the big difference between it? Have you said that in place? In the packet, I just put what the old conditions were oh. in there where it lists like the 65 decibels. Thing on our side, I don't know that we necessarily, in our side, I mean staff, not to say that what was there before is important, but I, when the, the board kind of gave the direction to work on a new permit, I mean, part of that's kind of saying that there's going to, you know, there is a racetrack there. What's a number that makes sense? One of the arguments that's come up, you know, again and again is because the sound was the big thing that came up. Well, where did that number come from? And so I don't know if we, if it's even relevant what the old number was if we're moving forward. Um, the other things that were in there, there were some things that were kind of uh, Central Jackson County related. I don't think we're going down that. I think we're leaving that to them. Um, I don't think that's no, something right. we're going to get into with that as far as the fire lane and that kind of thing. I mean, they, I assume they probably do their yearly inspection like they do with most businesses. Um, so that would be a difference for what we're looking at tonight, I guess, compared to what was there before. Um, missing anything? Well, he can race uh, pretty much seven days a week, 24 hours a day, which we know he's not going to do. But that was, that was and I guess I should mention that too. That was one of the other things was there just wasn't there wasn't a whole lot there to even know what was acceptable and what wasn't. So the idea with this one, I guess, is being more specific on what's being asked for and what's being expected. So that's, you know, we talk about race events and sound and how it's measured, that kind of thing. I think that was the idea with, with this new permit, was having something where you could look at it and the rules were, were clear on it. And not clear, I guess, isn't right. They were agreed upon going forward. So do you have any issue with the whole school night question that the city had? I would like the option, should a event come available, at least to be able to come to the uh, council and ask that I could, you know. For the most part, no. I don't think I've ever had one on a Wednesday school night. Uh, well, I say never. Maybe one in seven years, six years, however long I've been on the track. So there might have been one in a, but most of them, if you look, are in. Um, May, June, or June, July, August is whenever we try to schedule the, the Wednesday night shows, the weeknight shows. And then um, as to the concerns that they brought up about the quieter events, um, I see some of their concerns. It's a little ambiguous in terms of what you might be asking. Um, so are you wanting no limitation on the quantity of events or that they just be not regulated under the permit. Well, uh, what, well, if I read, it says city will not limit quieter events. Are you asking? No well, limitation? let's say I want to have a, a go-kart event, let's say, uh, or a, and again, this, the, the motorcycle events, the way I understand it, are um, grandfathered. Is that a correct assumption? The, the, yes. So if we, and again, it's an event that's not going to be noisy. I mean, the motorcycle events, the demolition derbies, stuff like that, that was already being done out there at the facility prior to being built. So I guess what I was saying was anything that was being done before coming into the city limits isn't something that's going to count against my 45 events. And I may never ever have more than 45 events. So the, num the number of events then? Correct. Okay. Can I clarify something? Um, I mean, the, the motocross track is grandfathered in um, with demolition derbies. I don't think those would be grandfathered in because they haven't been run continuously. So since the motocross track has been run continuously, it's grandfathered in. Um, I don't think we've got issues with demolition derbies, but I just want to clarify that 
I understand. It's, it's I mean, not. Yeah, they, I mean, they did them out there before in the yeah. where this is out. But if we did one, it would be one a year. And it may be that it's going to fall into the four to five dates. I mean, it, it may not be a big deal one way or the other. I just don't want to get into a situation where uh, I've got expenses to meet and the only way I meet is, and some of these running events, and I think they've already agreed to that, that if we have a running event, we have another one coming up this year in May that it draws, you know, a couple of thousand people, but it's a non-motorized event, so I don't want that to be counted as one of my events, you know. I would just want the the rate, car races, I guess, counted as my 45 events, and it may not make any difference, but I just don't want to get in that box. I just, I want to address it now rather than later if it, how many, we start having more. How many events do you think those six or so areas make up in a year. Go-karts, tractor pulls, demo derbies, motorcycle, non-motorized, events with less than 10 cars. How many of those? If you count everything, run, everything I've got listed there, it could be as many as 25 in a year. But again, that's running events and uh, if you want to count everything listed there. You know, I just wouldn't touch it. The non-motorized stuff is not part of this. That's not something that's part of that whole conditional use permit. So, like I said, the tough mutters or whatever, right. that kind of stuff is not in any way associated with this. Probably permit. the only thing I could see possibly if we wanted to do any go-kart events, uh, and it, there's nothing on the table right now, I just for future development of the facility, uh, I just don't want to get in a situation where somebody says, well, you can't do that. And there, it, it's, from a sound issue, it's not going to be a problem. I just don't want it to count it against my events. Same way with the motorcycle events that we've done out there all along. There's going to be some motorcycle events that we will do out there. And it's not a noise issue event, but I don't want somebody coming out there saying, well, you've already ran X number of events, counting those events that uh, aren't a sound issue type of event that mm -hmm. is a problem. Right. To the, the sound issues with the, the CEP, I, mean, I don't think that's going to be an issue. Yeah, I didn't think so. The only noise issue, and, and I've not been to a lot of tractor pulls, but I understand that it would be pretty loud, or they yeah. can be. So that was the only question I had. Um, if you want to put this tractor, take it out, that's fine. I was, I've, I've only done one in seven years, so I just... Certain classes are only going to be loud. Mm -hmm. Your multi-engine tractors. Yeah. Most of your farm tractors as they run tractor pulls are turbine. They're not loud. Right. Okay. During the day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. During He's the on day. A you Sunday might have afternoon. your class at night. I remember but it's tractor pulls at midnight. But yeah. I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, the reason I have an 11 o'clock curfew is because at 11 o'clock I'm ready to go home. I don't care if the races are or not. I'm done. It sucks to get cold, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> so. What about uh, practicing? Cars. A track at a time. Whenever we do a test and tune in March, there's one car out there, and I'll guarantee you nobody's going to hear it. I, I don't want that to be counted. If we're doing testing, my insurance company only allows <coughs> one car out there, so you're not going to hear it. I just want to change the wording on that, that bottom section you're just referring to. So the city would like the number of acquirer events. Yeah. Yeah, once we motion for that, let's get into some of that language. For sure. Okay. So we just need to kind of agree on the decibel number. Are you finished before we, I don't want to cut you off. Yeah, no. Okay. Unless you guys didn't get any more questions. Um, thank you very much. So now is the, um, let's move on to the action items portion of our meeting tonight. Well, before, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Can I say one more thing? Um, I don't think I heard anybody really say anything in opposition about your track. And I know there are a lot of people out there that, that really don't like the noise limit. So I guess I'm going to say something that I know that there's a lot of people out there that don't like the noise, especially the people that live pretty close. I live probably a mile and a half away. You just live right up the street from Scott. And, and I, can hear the, I can hear your track inside of my house in the summertime with the windows closed, the air conditioner on, and the TV running. Now, it's not that obnoxious to me, uh, but I know it is. If I live closer down by Artie Mize and, and uh, Buckner Tarsney, it would be very loud to me. Um, now, I know you're going to do what you can to keep it quiet, but I'm not sure that you're going to do enough to keep it quiet to keep people from still complaining. And I think we'll still get a lot of complaints if you go ahead and, and go ahead with this, this conditional use permit, no matter what you do. And I know, have, you put, have you put mufflers on it before? Keep something in mind. 
the sand drag track, which is probably, if you want to take some sound readings, probably 135 decibels when they race. Mm -hmm. uh, they can race seven days a week, 24 hours a day if they choose to. Okay. And a lot of that noise you're talking about hearing isn't me. Okay. Just, again, I'm not okay. trying, but those real loud noises you hear mm -hmm. aren't me. Okay, well, what distinguishes is that the ability? Is that just a grandfather? Grandfather. Okay. So, I mean, whenever people call and say we heard this horribly loud, it's don't automatically assume it's me. Okay. Because that's going to be a problem you're going to have uh, in the future. In fact, one year the racetrack was closed before I bought it, they had an issue with the bleachers out there and they shut down. And they told me it's out front that they had more complaints that year than they ever had, and we weren't even running. Really? We yeah. didn't even run that year, and they had complaints every week. And I, I think you will still continue to get complaints. So I don't know if this is going to solve the problem. But just reading through the notes, it looks like every other Board of Aldermen meeting, somebody comes and complains about the noise. Is that a true statement? I mean, I don't come to your Board of Aldermen meetings, but... Well, I think the thing to remember, too, is the permit that was in place before, that sound level wasn't being met. So it was against the, the permit. And I think that was it's one of the things going forward. That's the point of having the public hearings and that is figuring out what that balance is so we get that down on paper mm -hmm. so we actually, I mean, we know what it is. With any law, I mean, there's going to be some people that are happy with it and some that aren't, but it's having something that everybody agrees upon. So going forward, we can say, well, he's meeting what's in the permit. He's following the law. So uh, not that answers your question, but are the, are the question is, do we even give him a condition use permit? That is an option to not even hmm? give him a condition use permit. Is that is that true? Well, I mean, you always have a decision, yeah. And then it's yeah. up to the board of aldermen. If they want to go ahead and do it. It's up to them. True. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it is an application, but yeah. I can. so yeah, we've got a couple, um, I guess, options at this point. If we're going to close the hearing. Um, we don't have to approve anything, but we can entertain a motion to approve or to dis discuss further um, conditional use permit. Like Bob suggested, we don't have to do anything at all. Um, a lot of the questions I think ask for are to take advisement from the board who's suggesting we work something out. And so um, I think that's where this thing was steered to. Um, so the action items closes the public comment portion. And I say that just so we can maintain some semblance of order as we discuss. So it um, gives us the ability to discuss freely without a lot of the pressure from whatever. Um, so we're going to close the public comment. And um, if there's a motion on the table, then we can discuss whatever motion that is and work out details if there are any. So do we have a motion? I move that we discuss the conditions of the deputy conditional use permit. I'll second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, any discussion on those motions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, none opposed. So let's uh, go ahead and discuss a potential conditional use permit for uh, racetrack facility at 348 East Old U.S. Highway 40. I don't have any problem with the number of events. I don't really have any problems with most of what he's asking for. The two, the three areas that I think we really need to work on is one, the decibel, and the sound level he's, he's able to obtain and stand. Two, I think that we need to take away the 1,200 foot um, measurement and do it for it's then being measured at and we'll go into one property line. As long as there's a consistent spot and it's and it's set to where he can, it can be measured at the same place every time. I think that would be the way to do it. I don't want to do a, a huge radius. Let's just say that it's to be measured at the, at the fourth property line. You want to go off just the one property line? The north property line? Yes. It's, it's, the, the, closest, shortest distance. it's the shortest distance. And, and that's where all of the measurements that we it's have. in a package of from. That's where all the measurements that we have were taken from. That's where so the measurements on these readings were taken off from that point. Yes. Right. Which that'd be the worst case scenario. Right. Theoretically, right. sound's right. not going to get louder. Right. Shouldn't. Um, right. Away. It shouldn't. Right. Well, if you have a train along with no. the races at the top, who knows? Right. I, I don't know if we had a train to go through at that time when they were pulling those readings. Do you? Oh, yeah. No. 
Oh, I know, way high. Um, I mean, that could be an issue if you actually have both of them at the same time. You have to take that into account. I mean, well, but there again, right, you have to take it into account. But. So, James, back to the uh, number of races in terms of the day of the week. Anybody have any issue with the Saturday or every Saturday, every other Friday? Is that that's what's proposed here? Plus one. Weeknight. Week well, that's seven per year. It, it right. could be that's seven in a row. Right. Or one per seven weeks. The one thing I would like to, I would like to limit is we're going to do it during a school night. Um, and just say this that we have somebody ask the board and get approval for that for a special, yeah. event. special, special event permit or something. During school night. And I'm just trying to keep the complaints off your back, Dennis, because they're going to be coming if you do it on a school night. There'll be a lot of mad moments. Okay. We, that could be a problem, though, too. If a lot of these sanctioned bodies, when they come in and they want to run, a say, a weeknight, their schedules are limited. He may not know the schedule until February. Is that going to be an outside time to come present the issue with the city at that time to run that date or not? I mean, how can they grant it within a week? Or whatever. Okay. Worst case scenario, two weeks. Yeah. Worst case scenario. Okay. 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 So going down the list here, the sound issue um, seems to be a pretty big one. So looks like during what was considered to be the loudest time during using one minute averages, the LEQ didn't quite reach 85, but came close. Right, probably about 83. And that's a one-minute average, so we can, mathematically, I don't know what it would be, but we can assume it would be a little bit lower than that. Change it to a three-minute average? I think the three-minute, I mean, I'm no right. audiologist, but... That actually, I think, is a little bit better than Dennis' statement of a few minute window versus a one minute window. Okay. Now, what about the dust? Well, 90 was never hit here, and the only thing we've got is conjecture and that it might go up in the fall. I mean, it likely will. We just don't know the number. So or the spring. Or, the, same or the spring. Leaves, right. right. The first early races where we don't have leaves buffering some of the sound or whatever the case may be or the wind's blowing that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so all I've got really is your statements affecting that we can expect a five to seven decibel influx. Do you guys have any comment on that in terms of what that might mean, or if you guys have checked anything? The only thing I would say, even if we look back at the 2010 study that the city had done, I don't. There was the two property lines that were over, but using that three-minute average, I think even the north line was. Yeah, it was. I think it was under. Maybe it was 70. Well, it's actually 70. Yeah, it was 60, 73. That was the average. That was yeah, that was a three minute, and that was for the north, and I think maybe the south line was 67. There were two that were over that 65 at that point. And that was during what you're proposing would be more peak sound seasons? Yeah, I mean, there's been, I think perception has been different in the different seasons, but I don't know that we've seen a huge number difference as far as actual sound level. Um, and I... During different times and different nights, to make, I can hear it at my house. This year, mm -hmm. last year has been relatively quiet. Yeah, and one of the things that's come out kind of too is sometimes it's not even necessarily like the the actual sound level that's changing. It's almost more of like a tone Ability that to happens. And yeah, right. that's something that's not going to be picked up by any measure. So, well. This is just me, but without, we've got a, we've got a statement 
which is believable, but I don't have anything to go off scientifically from that. These charts at least tell us that they're below 85 at what the maximum is. Um, so this is just discussion, but I've, I think 85 is probably a good peak. I just researched the maximum that I found on most of your Schoenfeld mufflers is 95 decibels. Just taken at the car. At the car? At the car. When I did my research, uh, m almost all the tracks require Schoenfeld mufflers, and they rated 95 decibels. So that'd be more the of the car. car. That's at the car. To, Dennis, or the functional race muffler that you're referring to, is that similar to the Schoenfeld muffler? Yeah, the Schoenfeld he's talking about is one of our spec mufflers. We have three, they have to run, and that's one of Okay. And that's kind of what we shot for. And that's at the car within 75 to 100 feet of the car. Okay. Almost every sanctioning body that I did research on runs the same muffler, or the three different types of mufflers. Yes. All sanctioning bodies. And what were they? They were ASCS, World of Outlaws, All Star Midgets, IMCA, USAC, uh, 95. 95. At the car. 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 That's at the car. So, okay, that's fine, but what are we going to say at the property line? Or we'll say just north of the, the track. Right? At the north track, I, I couldn't tell you. If they're running the. That Schoenfeld muffler, it is what these readings are. I know there are some states that are more stringent than what Missouri is. Uh, I believe it was Oregon was 80 is the maximum. Uh, how they acquired that, I'm not sure. I know the state did their readings. So does Washington. Washington does their readings, and so does the state of Florida. Uh, the government officials come out and measure the readings. Mr. Renault, just to kind of give you, we pulled that 2010 study. And at the north, near the north property line, the LEQ in that study was 74. So it's not really a whole lot different than uh, when Mr. Shrout's um, consultant did the work. It's that seems like it's okay. been fairly consistent there. And that's a you know four years later. 85. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to that. Okay, that is that the high mark, and then the post 10 p.m. mark. Any differences there? 80. So 85 and 80. Yeah. And then in terms um, of the per car issue that we were talking about a second ago, mm -hmm. The 95, so it sounds like you agree 95 is a pretty standard marker per car. The ones that I talked to said it was at 100 feet, 95. And if they had a rope, they just put on the car and went out 100 feet. And I think it was at around 3,000 RPM. Right. I saw 3,000 or 4,000 RPM is what I saw. Yeah. Well, yeah. The difference between what I hear you say is at the car versus 100 feet. Well, 100 feet. 100 feet. Okay. I mean, we're not talking yeah. 1,200 feet. We're talking 100 feet. Okay. And I did talk to some of the drivers and some of the people that I know. They've never been checked. Okay. They check to see if the muffler's on the car. You can tell if there's a muffler on the car. Yeah. And they're not allowed to run. If you don't have a muffler, you're not allowed to run, period. Do you check every every vehicle at your events? Yeah. We have a pre-tech. All your requirements would be pre-tech, and we check mufflers. Yeah. If he checks it, you're going to hear it, trust me. Yeah, <laughs> big difference. Big difference. Okay. Okay, I've got that. And then, um, sounds like we don't care about the number of these so-called quieter races. No, no not the number. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, we just want them to comply with the same DB requirements, it sounds like, yeah. as everything else. Okay, how about a length of time if we were to move forward on this for the permit? That's my suggestion. We don't be doing this every year. No. Mm -hmm. See how it goes for three years, then we can adjust okay. to that after we... And then... Um, in terms of the checks, 
um, do we need to do we want to specify a period of when that's going to happen or per year do a check and make sure we're in compliance or what was the last one On the number of checks per year, I mean, can we, can we say we'd like the city to do at a minimum of, say, three checks per year, mid, or beginning, mid, and end, to make sure that uh, Mr. Shaw's in compliance? What's the cost of the or check? are you only going to do the checks whenever they're complaining? I don't know if we, to answer your question, if we did, it would more than likely be in-house with that. I don't know if we had a set time in mind to do them. I mean, I think it was more... A periodic or if we're we're getting complaints then we go out and verify that yeah he's we might be getting complaints but he's oh. within the the confines of the permit so we tell him that so okay. I don't know if we had like specific times I'd like to see is a minimum of three random checks per year I, I'm not gonna say you have to do it at this time this time and this time but I, I think that we need to actively monitor for a few reasons one to, to protect mr. shot make sure he can continue to do business and two to protect the community and make sure that he's staying under what he says he's going to do. So we'd be compelling the city to do that, which probably wouldn't shouldn't be on him if we did it. That'd be probably <laughs> what I'm saying is that the city has their handheld handheld device that they can utilize to check. Or do you guys have them? I mean, yeah, and I to agree with Mr. Renault, I don't think our intent was to to put this on him to go and do the sound study. I think it was on us to right. to patrol, but. With that, I don't know if, if that's something that necessarily gets included in here. I think that's more a kind of a directive from you and the board that says you will go out and check three times. Because I think the things that we put in here are what we're expecting Mr. Shrout to do as the operator of the racetrack. Okay. And then if there are um, – are there any built-in remedies that need to be added to this in terms of if there's noncompliance after a month in? allow the CUP to just write it out for the next two years and 11 months, or do we need like a time to cure those issues if there are complaints or? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that, that we've discussed. Um, you know, under the, under, under the ordinances, they do address when revocation can occur and there's no right to cure period okay. um, in, in, the, in the ordinance itself. But if you want to put it in the conditional use permit, you know, if there, if this, because there's no written notification or anything like that that's required under the ordinance. So it's just automatic revocation? No, 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 it is not automatic revocation, but if there's one violation, uh, the way the ordinances without being modified read are, if there's a violation, um, a conditional use permit can be revoked. You've got to give notice and there has to be a hearing on that, but it can be revoked for, you know, one single violation. Um, so I think one thing that we would probably suggest would be um, if there is a violation of the conditional use permit that the city needs to provide Mr. Shrout written notice and give him 30 days to, to fix the violation. Um, right. So that way we don't, if there's just one violation, you don't get ordinance violation tickets or anything like that, that there is a time period to, to fix it before, we, before, it gets, before it gets escalated. Um, I mean, I think, Dennis, I don't know if you've got thoughts or, because I, I think that's... I tend to agree with that. I mean, if there's something wrong, I would like to know it where I can. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And something else, we need to revoke it. on the worst test I've taken at, yeah. it's on the north side of the railroad tracks. I would like to keep it. That's where we've always done it. And that's not really the property line. You put it at the north side of the railroad track, that's the property line. Where all of our data, that's where it's at. I don't know if we put it on this side of the railroad track, it may change the can I, I was I don't know what we, we, so. we can actually replicate that location and include it in the CUP so if the planning and zoning has a recommendation for a CUP basically what that gives us is we're going to move forward to the board well we're going to continue to work with you as we prepare the ordinance for the board of aldermen so we could actually put an exhibit together that shows the spot that we'll go off of so there's no question about it Yeah, I think so. Okay, any other specifics? Just one, one other thing that's, that's in the ordinances um, are just general um, compliance with 
um, land use ordinances and construction and building codes. Um, so I think that may be some, I mean, that's in the ordinances. I mean, obviously everybody in the city has to comply with. That'll trump. With, with building codes. Um, so I don't know if we need to do any building code inspections or anything, um, you know, prior to, you know, opening up or anything like that. Um, but, but the building codes all apply. Um, so that may be something that we want to mention in the conditional use permit as well. So then other than these issues that we're specifically dealing with, building codes, what else? Generally, the city code ought to be followed. That's your Yes. Point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all of the city code, you know, obviously it, it all has to apply. Um, but if there's anything um, regarding just because there, this is a, a different structure in the city than, you know, any other structure because there's going to be a significant amount of people there, whether the city wants to, needs to check on an annual basis as opposed to, you know, checking building codes when there's a complaint. Just just because of the number of people who are going to be there. Well, n no, there's, there's no set schedule where the city checks. You know, the city checks. <coughs> Uh, the city can check whenever it wants right. to, but there's, but there's, no, there's, there's no set schedule. It's not like the, the fire department that would have an annual check. So you guys have the freedom to do these checks. You just, you don't want to be precluded from it, which I don't think that's what we're talking about. It's like any other business. Right, and I think what we're saying is do we want to be having notify the city, I plan on opening up on this date so this, you know, if you're going to have 2,000 people out there that so the city can know there's going to be 2,000 people out there and maybe we want, we want to go check check it out since, you know, it's been closed all winter to make sure that everything out there is still safe. Because that's a requirement in the code already. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think maybe part of what Mr. Geary is touching on there too is that, I mean, every year things change. I mean, I'm sure Dennis does, tries to add new things every year. I mean, whether whether it's a structure or not, you know, I don't know, but maybe kind of more like what the fire department does, you know, having that annual inspection, just going out there strictly from a public safety point of view. I mean, you know, we've talked all night about how that is a destination place. There are a lot of people there. Just making sure that everything's still ready to go after the winter, basically, I think would maybe yeah. be the way yeah, to look at that. Well, we don't need us to do that, though, right? Yeah. I mean, we don't need to authorize your ability to inspect yeah. it, do we? No, I think, what, no. no, but what we're saying in the CUP is that we are recommending that they probably should do right. a yearly inspection of, this of the facilities prior to the open season race right. to make sure that he is in compliance with all of the uh, city building, building codes. Because the city can go in and inspect any time, but we're saying because of what it is a destination place, because right. of the number of individuals right. that go there, because of the type of event that happens, right. we want to put that extra measure in there to make sure right. that it's a, it's a safe environment for all the citizens of Green Valley and everybody else to go to. Sure, I think um, I understand the purpose. I don't know if we can yeah, shackle I'm, him with our job. I'm all about safety, but I Maybe, it seems that's like we're, more illegal. we're, we're I, I don't yeah. Unless we're holding every business, do we expect, do we go in and inspect Casey's? Do we go in and inspect Casey's because he's having a race that weekend? No. Uh, so why are we singling out That's the speedway? Yeah, I don't know that that was, I don't think that was the intent. I think the intent more being, a racetrack isn't a typical type, okay, you brought up Casey's. Casey's is built, there's not a whole lot that's going to change with the Casey's, whereas I mean, a lot of racetracks on a yearly basis in the off season they make improvements to the the racetrack, and I think the comments were more based towards when those improvements are made, making sure that you know that that is when we're out there notify that something's going on, that they're changing, and that you know we're ensuring that it it does meet those codes. Christian, uh, would you be against having a yearly inspection just to make sure that the facilities is up to par prior to? I'll be honest with you, yes. Why is that? My insurance handling comes out every year before we open up and he always do it and tells me any changes I need to make and I'll be quite honest with you. I don't want the city in my business. You know, I will I don't have a problem with all your codes and stuff and we have to comply with anyway, but I don't think I should be shackled with stuff that all the other businesses don't have to do. Well and and I understand where the city's coming from. I I, have, I appreciate what you're saying. However, every other business in Grand Valley doesn't have, you know, 
vehicles hurling around a track at X number of miles an hour, and they don't have you know stands full of fans and children and, and everything else. But, but James, that's why his insurance. I'm gonna tell you right now, I've been around racing a long time, basically my whole life, and I've been to a lot of racetracks and I've seen people killed in the stands. And I know for a fact his insurance company would not allow him to open that facility unless he was abiding by what they deem safe. I don't think the city goes <coughs> before the school every year before they have their first football oh, yeah. game to uh -huh. inspect all their facilities. Okay, and then I then guarantee you those stands have a lot more people in them than what the racetrack does. Okay, then do you I just don't think that, that I think this is... That's not our business. I, 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 just, well, yeah, I, I think one of the other issues is that this, and it has nothing to do with the bleachers, but the school district had uh, an engineer stamped plans and the bleachers were inspected when they were constructed. So, so maybe even not uh, something annual, but yet yeah, insurance uh, is not responsible for life safety. The, the city of Grain Valley is, insurance is not the code authority in our city. The city of Grain Valley is charged with building uh, inspections, building compliance and life safety issues. And that's, that's the only place where I would disagree. Yes, insurance is insuring a risk. But uh, insurance isn't going out and inspecting buildings that, that we're constructing. We have a building official that does that. That's and it, what, well, it seems like that ought to be the, the method it's checked. I would, unless I'm missing what you're saying. Like, if I build a fence, I'm supposed to get a permit, too, at my house. But, so if he builds a new structure or something like that, I'm guessing he has to follow the same sure. yes. rules. Yeah, and I, I think in the past, one of the things that the city's trying to get uh, about this this point is that bleachers have been installed the city wasn't contacted and then after the fact we went out and saw them it has nothing to do with the construction or the material but we just don't have any idea you know the craftsmanship or what these bleachers are or you know if they're even open for business so i would say when new improvements like that are put in that yeah the city has an obligation to go out and inspect that and make sure that there aren't life safety issues just like CJC goes out and, and does inspections on new construction. Okay, so I think we could make it then conditional to the CUP continuing that the codes followed? He followed, yeah. yeah. Yes. So if he erects a structure that he didn't tell you about, CUP void. Yeah, and I, kind of what really it's, yeah. I, I look at Matt, but really I think it's, it's probably just more formality. It's it's because that's what how the code reads right now. If the building codes aren't followed, we just want to avoid that issue. We want to be up front in, in the very beginning and say that the building codes are going to be followed and that new construction has to, you know, comply with reasonable life safety standards. So rather than not draw attention to that in the CUP process in a year from now, if we have you know problems with some sort of building construction or something new goes up. Let's just be upfront with it, get it out there, and realize that's an area of focus that the city wants to be involved in in the future because we have that obligation. Okay. All right, I think we're all on the same page after all that. Okay. Any other uh, verbiage? What are you going to say to that? I've tried to summarize it here, so um, unless there's more input, let me see if I can word this. Please. And then, James, this was your motion, so feel free to jump in, anybody, but James especially. So um, we have a motion on the floor to consider and discuss this. Let me try to phrase it, um, how it might be proposed. And if this is accurate, I'll just, we can maybe move just to propose it as I say it here in a second. So um, we've got a motion then to approve a uh, conditional use permit for Dennis Shrout's property at the address we already talked about, uh, 348 East Old US 40 Highway. Um, the proposal found just prior to page one of our package tonight uh, was listed by Mr. Shrout, where he proposes 45 race car events per year. Not to, and those numbers would not include the race tests and tunes, that, uh, the March tests and tune races, which we understand to be practice sessions. Uh, 45 events would take place between April and October, a seven month period. It would be two race nights every other weekend, Saturday night one week, Friday and Saturday the following week. There will be an 11 o'clock p.m. curfew during race nights. The decibel uh, limits will be 85 decibels on the high end, 
until 10 o'clock at night, and then 80 decibels from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night when the racetrack would close. We would be proposing that the tests would be conducted in the same manner as they have been on these reports that we've been provided, and to be done at the north property line, but specifically in the same spot that these tests have been conducted, which we are understanding to be in a cul-de-sac just north of the railroad tracks. Right. James Rollo, James okay. Rollo Court. Which, uh, hearing is James Rollo Court. Um, all cars must meet 95 decibel limit measured at 100 feet uh, sound measured 100 feet behind the car, tethered with a rope or, or some similar fashion, as defined at 3,000 to 4,000 RPMs. The weeknight races uh, will be limited to seven per year and defined as Monday through Thursday night events. That will not include school nights unless Mr. Trout successfully uh, applies to the cities for a special um, application for that particular event. The city would then do its due, due diligence to ensure that that application would be processed as quickly as possible. Um, all cars must run functional race mufflers, which we discussed uh, with the 95 decibel limit. There will be no limitation on the amount of of the events, um, of these quieter events listed here, being motorcycle, demo derby, truck and tractor pulls, go-kart events, any event with less than 10 cars on the track. However, those events would still follow the decibel rules. The conditional use permit would be valid for three years from the time the board approves it. If there, well, let me, let me uh, switch this here. Um, we're also proposing that the applicant maintain full compliance with any city building codes, um, generally and specifically, and that all permits applications would still apply, <laughs> except for the specific things mentioned in the language of the permit, so that any new construction or structures built on the property would have to follow and abide by that, just like everyone else would. The length, uh, we discussed the length three years. Mm -hmm. um, should there be uh, any violations uh, of the conditional use permit, the city will be required to provide notice and the applicant would have 30 days from the date of notice to cure said complaint. Make sure I'm not missing anything else. I miss anything? What if, if on that last, on the complaint deal, if he has a 30 days, and if 31 days it still hasn't complied, what happens at that point? Uh, the city, I suppose, would have its ability to um, start the revocation process. That's right. Okay. Okay. So we have discussed. I move. We have a second. second. We have a second. Do we have any discussion on the conditional use permit? All right. Okay, let's have a vote then. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Um, I don't think we need a roll call. Do we? Yeah, I would. Okay. I would. Um, I said no, I would because you're not. We do? Yeah. Okay, let's have a roll call then, just for the record. Okay, um, Mike Renault voted yes. James Spicer? Yes. Kevin Browning? Yes. Bob DeMitt? No. Kerry Boardman? Yes. Debbie Saffel? Yes. Hayden Ambrose? Yes. Scott Schaefer? I can't vote. No vote. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I know whether to say not vote or sustain. <laughs> Sustains for procedural reasons. Okay. All right, the uh, motion passes as read. move on to the uh, next item, which is previous business. Looks like we have none. Nothing in this. 
Okay. Um, items, I'm sorry, eight, new business, also none. Okay. All right. Brings us to motion we adjourn. Adjournment. <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. I'm looking forward to that. We are adjourned. <laughs>